I won the WJKA World Championships in 2011, 2013. Uh, WJKA Europeans won that, I think, around the same time. Um, well, we talk about we talk about a black belt as if it's a standard. Mm. It's not. No, it's just right. a point. It's a point of time. It's a point of like how long how long you've been training, what uh, you know what you what you've done. You get to that point, and then it's how you deal with it after that, isn't it? Like some guy that hadn't trained hardly at all had me on the ground. And I had no answer for it, and that for me was like obviously the best thing now to keep me coming back because I had no answer for him on the ground, and it was right I'm never going to get and every day I train gets me further away from that point she was moving you could feel her moving around and everything and by the time we got from there to the hospital she'd obviously died and then there wasn't a lot of I'd never felt there was any I had any help without the martial arts in, involved yeah I, I, I wouldn't like to think you know yeah. I, I would, would I be in the same place no, I, I doubt it very much Go on, mate, tell me the story. Right. So there's a guy that used to um, come in my shop when I when I used to own the shop. And he was walking through, he was late for work one day. He was, used to work with my wife. He was late for work one day and he turned around and he said the reason he was late for work was that he got stopped by the police on, the, on his way to work. So he's walking through town and he's got a sword on his back. So the police stop him and say that you're not allowed that sword. So they say, you know, give it here. He goes, right, <laughs> takes it off. <laughs> bangs it in the ground into the concrete and says if you can take it out of the uh, out of the floor then you can then you can have it so the police said he said I'm trying to take it out <laughs> can't do it <laughs> and then he um, and then he goes like this bang pulls it out one hand pulls it out resheaths it and says have a good day officers <laughs> and walks to work and that's why he was fucking late for work what a fucking legend huh <laughs> Yeah, I got. <laughs> yeah, mate. People are fucking mental with martial arts. I used to work with this guy, and uh, I think it was actually ninjutsu that he did. Ninjutsu. So, ninjutsu. What's ninjutsu? It's a style of martial art. These are his words, where they train to basically punch through steel because nin ninjas would fight samurais, so their, their their striking was designed to punch through armor. So it made it really dangerous to hit normal people with it because you'd kill them. And uh, I can remember I was chatting to him once because he found out I was doing MMA at the time. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, I wouldn't mind just coming down and training with some of you guys. And I was a bit like, oh, it's one of these things that, I don't know, I was young as well. So there's a tiny weenie bit of me that maybe like this guy is really lethal or he's probably full of shit and he's going to get chinned. And he said, oh, I want to come down and train with you. And I was like, oh, I don't know, mate. I mean, the, the, some of the lads are training with their actual fighters. And he was like, yeah, yeah. You know, he said, you'd have to take it easy on me, though, because, you know, if it got out of hand, I'd have to use some of my deadly techniques and someone might get really hurt. <laughs> And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I know where this is going before. No, you no, I, I didn't. I didn't, but I was technical. Yeah, come on down, mate. Just do it. But in oh, the you end, didn't get him down? No oh, way. It's just, that would have been fucking but brilliant. Fucking hell, there's loads of them in there. Yeah, oh, fucking mate. Yeah, yeah, mad. Yeah, anyway, Steve Hollister, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Gents. How are you, mate? All right? Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so you're, uh, you're, you're not a man who, who, who kind of knows much about fake martial arts. Because I think it's fair to say that you're probably one of the most credentialed martial artists that I know. I know you won't admit that, um, <laughs> but you're going to have to tell us a little bit of your credentials because I know you as as one of the coaches at Flow Martial Arts in Plymouth. Right. Um, I've known you primarily from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, of which you're now a uh, brown belt. Um, but prior to getting into Jiu-Jitsu, you have got a very long sort of career or, or time doing karate. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it'd be interesting if you take us all the way back to, I guess, how you got into karate and, and talk us through maybe, you know, each decade, what you've done and what you've achieved. Okay. And then it'd be really cool to understand because I guess you've, you've got that amazing view now of both styles of martial art, both the striking art and also grappling martial art as well. So I think it'd be good once we get to that point, just to tell us a little bit about your, your def the differences that you see and, and how you think that maybe two, the, work, the, the, the two work together. So how did you get into karate? Okay. Well, uh, dad used to train. Okay. Dad used to train uh, when I was like, so mid 70s when I started. Um, used to go with my dad. I was getting in trouble at school for fighting a little bit. And <clears throat> I was only like young then, but my mum almost, almost had like a, a seat outside the headmasters. <laughs> Did she? Yeah. <laughs> like, she, 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 she still got on about that. But, um, and then started karate as soon as it became big in 
like Plymouth really yeah okay. <laughs> like early to mid <coughs> excuse me early to mid 70s okay um and then just continued from there really yeah okay yeah, so going so back going back to the 70s then so that's um you know a little while for for, for most people listening, <laughs> um, the dark ages. So what was the scene like back then? Because these days, I mean, everybody watches the UFC. Most people are even complete sort of, um, you know, non-martial artists have an idea now of, of what martial arts are because of UFC and, and that type of thing. Yeah. What was it like back then without that sort of televised exposure? I was getting, from what I can remember, like 70, 75 I started and we was in, um, I remember like starting at the Mayflower obviously where the Life Centre is the old Mayflower and that sports hall that the, the big sports hall in there that was like full the classes were like <laughs> yeah I mean it was huge and then I would go in and train when obviously my class and then my dad's lot would all go on <clears throat> obviously when he was training um, and it was it was just everybody uh, it just seemed at the time that everybody did some sort of like martial art martial art and mm -hmm. it was predominantly crappy at the time it was like big in Plymouth there was what was big, it big in Plymouth was there a particular reason was there anything was I think it, it was, was just, it just, just, it was just a beam I think it was just it, the yeah. time yeah there weren't like there weren't like all the sports clubs that you could do nowadays it was very few and far between like sports facilities and sports actual different sports I don't know if they were all still around but they were never as like popular everybody either did sort of like football boxing karate from how I can remember it you know like that <clears throat> And, and we used to have like a running joke back in the day doing jujitsu because you'd say to someone, oh, I do jujitsu, and they're like, Oh, is that like karate? Yeah. Um, so, actually, just thinking about that, can you just explain what karate is in a nutshell? For so, people that might not know. Karate is like a, a, a stand up art yeah. um, from Okinawa with Japan. Um, predominantly like striking. The way it's evolved now, it's become more of a uh, just a stand up art. What people like see, you know, it's possibly a different art or it's evolved differently to how it was originally like brought about obviously unarmed combat for um uh fighting say yeah fighting in okinawa went after they after the matsumura um dynasty and all that outlawed any weapons or any training when they invaded okinawa so the the locals would find different ways of training and then it became a a an art or an underground like self defense type thing, and then it Is evolved. That evolved, was it? That's yeah, and that's where you get all the like the weapons, all like the nunchucks and things like that. They're all part of this thing. They're all like, um, like farming implements, like oars and things that because no one was you weren't allowed any metal weapons. Everything became these wooden weapons, and everybody's training was to use those weapons. And then if they got unarmed, then you'd use karate or karate means just like empty hands. So. That's, right, that's okay. what it means. Okay. So weaponless, weaponless, like um, combat, self-defense, really. Yeah. And then wow. it became uh, the Japanese saw it as a good, good thing for children. Got involved in the children's in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, got it involved in schools, and it became very stylized to put into like children's school, like children's like katas and things like that, and training. What's katas? So katas are like a, a form of movement. Do you know what you see? Everybody just walking up and down, punching yeah. the. The nowadays sort of piss take that is like <laughs> kind of point, pointless work, but at the time originally they were like two man things, so okay. they'd be like little drill, exactly what we do now. In gym. You know, you, you drill techniques, you, you drill things, that's what cutters were originally, okay. and then it became more formalized to take into schools, and that's when it blew up in the schools in the early 1900s, um, and then it became like stylized and um all these different like, um, syllabus came in, came in play. <clears throat> and then over the years, that gets taken away from how it was originally thing. Obviously, it's a war like um, art, but if you've got no war, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, everything gets slightly watered down, yeah. you've got no way to test it. And then it became like to where it is now. Yeah. But the same as any, any like art or thing, it becomes watered down the more it gets diluted. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's so true, isn't it? I was, um, I was just thinking when you were talking, I didn't realise that's how it originated from, like the, um, yeah, hiding it because you've obviously got capoeira, which is a Brazilian style, which is the dance of martial art, hidden in the dance. Yeah, and it exactly. was the exact same thing. Farmers banned from fighting because they were fearful of an uprising. Yeah. So they disguised their style of martial art as dances, and that's why capoeira is like a dancing martial art. Again, if you look back, that happened in India. That happened all yeah. the way through in that 
period of time frame when you know the war and factions and that was sort is of like some, is something like capoeira though effective if you get you know a good I mean? capoeira like, exponent it's the same that, yeah. with any art is isn't it, it? yeah Every, every shit art can have someone who's really good and it'd be really effective. Yeah. It just yeah, depends. Oh, so, yeah. And it's, I guess it's relative as well, isn't it? Because like, what, what's the comparison? You know, it's, it's not, you know, if you, a lot of people might say that MMA now is, is like the testing ground for martial arts, but modern, obviously, MMA is a combination of, of multiple martial arts, hence the name, mixed martial arts. Back in the day, it was more singular martial arts versus singular martial arts and capoeira was never one that really was presented in, in that setting. Yeah. So it was hard to know, yeah. but equally you put any martial art, you know, maybe even some of these idiots we just talked about a minute ago against somebody who's completely untrained and it's typically effective. Um, but you look at mixed martial arts now, yeah. mixed martial arts, you pick the best from each art. You know, you can't study every, every single art, every single detail of every art, but you pinch a little bit of each and then you put it together and have... Even like jiu-jitsu does now. that now, doesn't it? Even jiu-jitsu it's, does that. You know, exactly. you've got to be a good wrestler, really, to yeah, be good at jiu-jitsu. Yeah, certain things you, got, you, you know, wouldn't really. do in jiu-jitsu that um, you wouldn't do in MMA that you would do in your jiu-jitsu class, you yeah, know? Yeah. yeah, 100%. So, okay, so that's karate then. So you were you were a kid. And, and what did you yeah. get involved with? 70, 1975, you were, you were 30 then? So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just come out of my 30th birthday. Yeah. No, so I was six when I started. Okay. Um, and then obviously trained up through and just continued up. Yeah, okay. I was lucky when I got my, uh, one of those kid black belts. Yeah, you know, well, I wanted to, I wanted you know to talk you about talking this. about the yeah, other yeah. week. Yeah. yeah, and, but I wanted to ask because I, I, I don't know, like jujitsu, I mean, I don't make the rules, right? I was just explaining what the rules are in jujitsu regarding the belt system. Um, so I don't make the rules and I don't necessarily agree or disagree with it, but it feels like for me to, for a black belt in martial arts is a level of responsibility to having that knowledge. Yeah. Um, so I guess on that, I, I do question, obviously, that a child having been able to manage that responsibility. Am I just getting, am I just thinking too much into it? Like, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Well, for me, it was the right thing because now nearly 50 years later, I'm still training. Yeah. So for me, you know, that, that was the right thing to do. If I'd have maybe, if I hadn't have done it, would I still be training now? You don't know, you know. How, how old was you when you got your first, when you got your black belt? 10, it was two weeks after my 10th birthday. I got okay. black belt at 10. So four, year, four years that you get your black belt. Yeah. And I was, I was training all the time. And of, of course I was a kid. Of course I was a kid. I wasn't a black, you know, no one's saying I got a black belt as a child. I wasn't a, you a know. A black belt. It, it did, yeah. It, but my understanding and knowledge of what I had to do to get that, obviously was... Um, a syllabus style like base so I knew all the stuff that I needed to do and getting a black belt again one of those things is you only start learning a martial art once you get your black belt because the black belt is just the point where you have all the basic information and from that point you then yeah uh, you know you start learning that art you have all the tools you've read all your books you've got all your information about where you should be and that's where you start yeah yeah it's like a start you no know, again it, it, it's it's become something different and in different arts it means different things but at the time being a black belt in karate just meant he had all the tools to like take what, it forward what the, what's the belt system in karate is it is it the same as jiu-jitsu no so you'd have I think we had like eight or nine like um, Q grades which are base grades right okay. uh, so you'd have like white, red, orange, yellow, green, purple or two purples three browns and then you, so you'd have like eight or nine Q grades before you then go on to your oh, yeah. uh, eligible for your black belt. Black belt. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, sorry, and then mm. going back to, and then through, through that, like training, obviously I was a, like a kid black belt, but you had all those things. And when I took it, there wasn't, um, there were stacks of people that failed. Yeah. Okay. You know, they were big gradings. You'd have mm. like 40, maybe 50 people grading. Oh, 10, really? 20 would pass and the rest would all fail. It was like massive. So was it like a test? Yes. Was it like a test? Yeah. yeah. So it was like you have to show, demonstrate certain moves, certain techniques. Yeah, all your, all your syllabus, you know, all your, your your criteria that you'd have to do, you'd have to demonstrate that. You, you, you'd have to fight. Um, obviously, I wasn't fighting men. I was fighting <laughs> yeah, like yeah, guys yeah, my own right, age yeah. or just like, but I, I was younger than... Yeah. most of the others yeah yeah it's an interesting one because I, I also mentioned that same video that you alluded to about the child black belts obviously around the why they're awarded um 
and again, I was generalizing because I appreciate that even with traditional martial arts, as you've said, some are better than others, some are more watered down than others. And ultimately the grading and the, you know, who, who gets black belts and whatever belts are kind of to some extent dictated by whoever's running the school and that varies massively. Um, but I do, I do like, I do quite like that demonstration of technique, and it's something you don't see much in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, there's a there's a, a black belt called Roy Dean, yeah, um, who who does is that. He, is he on yeah. YouTube? He yeah, yeah, I watched that. I, wa I watched that. I know exactly what video. I was yeah. going to say that a minute ago. Yeah, so uh, so I I've, I enjoy watching the gradings. They're like amazing to watch because it's such a good demonstration of Jiu-Jitsu technique. He makes him do like two of everything, doesn't he? Two two sweeps. It, two it, it varies. You know, yeah, yeah. So he has it for every belt. So every belt he's obviously oh, got he? he's got a really clear syllabus. So blue belt you need to demonstrate all these techniques and uh, you know it's all the way up to black belt um, and the black belt's obviously massive in regard to the number of techniques and also you then need to apply that to resisting opponents um, so I quite like that but I appreciate that's not common in jiu-jitsu and it's it's more as I said previously based on sort of application oh, and attributes can get you past if they're not yeah. they? you know you not everybody's got the same style yeah of like training so you, you could miss it so that like I agree I like that way of mm. knowing that you know a certain criteria yeah. to get you to a certain point so but which yeah. sometimes you can lose a little bit in when it's um when it's not when it's pressure tested when it's just on pressure testing because then natural attributes come involved don't they and like you know you can get away with an awful lot if you're a big jack strong guy yeah who's quite supple and able to move their body can't you mm -hmm. you don't have to know an awful lot yeah i never really thought of that <clears throat> that's actually really true isn't it because if you if you are just an athlete you get, that can get you a long way. Well, like a Nicky Rod. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. He, yeah. 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 Exactly. What's he now? Yeah. Blue belt. Uh, I think he's a brown belt actually now, but yeah, it but doesn't matter, does it? When no, he was a blue belt, I mean, yeah. it doesn't. That's what I mean. Yeah. So it, that, that does get you a lot, but he probably didn't know anywhere near as much as ninety percent of the people that he was fighting. No, you know? no, not 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 from a broader term. He would have had a, a couple of really clear paths to yeah, success. Yeah, exactly. But that's and what I mean. That complemented his attributes. Thing, yeah, hundred percent. It's like very few and far between, isn't it? You know, not oh, yeah, it's that yeah, he's gifted athletes are gifted athletes, but as a as a whole, yeah. You can you can miss quite a bit. Yeah, I mean you know what it's like yourself. Yourself when you get you, you you're doing some technique and someone shows you something, you think shit. I should know another white belt. Yeah, like shit. And then you because like, you've never heard it or you've never yeah. seen. You might have you, you might, might have find your it. own way past it. Yeah, but that little nugget of information you think shit i should have known that yeah. or you've got someone telling you've never heard it it's easy to miss isn't it yeah and i think going back i mean you, you probably see it a little less these days because naturally like with anything jujitsu will water down a little bit as well hopefully it, it, not as much because of the application required yeah. but i remember and you can probably tell me if you agree with this now given your sort of position in, in both martial arts but back when i was starting like a blue belt in 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 jujitsu was considered like the same as a black belt in a lot of martial I've, arts I've, yeah. Uh, for the same reasons that you were just talking about where at a blue belt in jiu-jitsu you should know like sort of at a, a base level like pretty much every guard mm -hmm. all these various techniques um, and then once you get to blue belt then you start building on that and developing your game and start being a bit maybe a bit more aggressive with or whatever um, do, you, do you still agree that that's the case or do you think that's changed these days now I, I, th I think maybe even less than that now Okay. You, even less than a white belt compared to like other, and it depends what you, what your what the rule sets is of whatever you're competing in, doesn't it? You know, if the rule sets are one thing, it, it, that is it's it's rules that make styles yeah. or rules that make competition competitions because we've only got two arms, two legs. Mm -hmm. There's only so much we can all do. Yeah. It's only the difference of the rule sets between each one that actually makes it a specific style or that art won't beat that art. Mm. Well, yeah, but if you all had the same tools, of course, you know, you, then it becomes down to the individual and how they train, doesn't it? Yeah, 100%. So on that competition, so talk us through your competition history. So as a six-year-old, were you competing at that point? Yeah, I think I, was, I, I did my first comp, I was thinking of this, yeah, when we talked about this. And um, <clears throat> so I did my first comp in 1977 or 78. Yeah, and I can remember getting a little trophy, and it was a little little flat base with a little V on it. And this one trophy I can't find, but it was one I yeah. always I always remember. Yeah, that was my yeah. little first one. And then, uh, yeah, and then just I think I've continued competing up until about a couple of years ago. Yeah. So I, I I think I heard previously that you you've you've won some maybe not in the federation that you would have liked, but you've won some world titles. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what have you won? So, um, I've won the WJKA 
um, World Championships in 2011, 2013. Uh, WJKA Europeans won that, I think, <clears throat> around the same time. Um, SKD and World Silver Medal. That would, and that would have been my better one. That was in Qatar, I won that. Okay. That was the one I... that grips me the most. That I got silver. Tell us why. <laughs> it's because I got silver. Okay. Oh, right. and I, just, I just stand up there with a guy that beat me. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was that close to being... No, the goal in a big competition we were both clearly miles away from everyone else I'd gone through the first part of that with the highest scores so I like you know I, th- I thought I'd messed how, up how are those things judged obviously like where you're saying it was like catters and stuff so yeah. is it like you do one is it all that sort of like demonstrating technique and then that's the tournament or do you fight each other or what's it like it can be so as you can do one or the other so people can fight, people can do kata. You can enter, you can enter both. But we always used to do. I always made sure that I was always kata and kumite. So I would always do. I would always fight and do kata. Okay. They do the team and then do the team kata. So I did like all the uh, elements to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I like back from my dad. He says there's no good at fighting if you've got shit technique because then it just becomes attribute based again. Whereas like kata being a good Cat exponent who could fight, it meant you you technically were good at your art. Kind of, yeah. So kind of backs up your, your, it backs your up technique, the fact, Yeah, it? because yeah. else it could be just like again, anyone can anyone can fight, anyone can get a lucky punch on somebody yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. do all that thing. But if you've got good technique and you've worked on that and you've you put a lot of time into it, that becomes a different level of being a Kratika. You know, someone who does who who did cry to a like high level and put all those let all that um yeah. time into it you know yeah so that was that one was a that one was catter in that yeah yeah okay um and i'm sure i had something else as well about there was something you mentioned on the previous podcast that i saw you on where you, you i think you maybe had competed in every decade for like yeah. for, for how many years now yeah so um yeah in every decade since the 70s 80s 90s zeros and won big tournaments in each, each yeah, of those. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So I still want to do it. It was only this that's yeah. uh, <laughs> buggered me up since then. But I've still got that thing that I, I've still got something good inside me yet to... You're still going to do it? Get, yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. And that's, that keeps me... That's what keeps me going now. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine, yeah. That, that drive to do... I've got that oh, performance... Yeah. I've got that, whatever it is, I don't care, but I know I've got that. You've got it in here yeah. still, yeah. Well, that's what, I'm, that's, that's what I'm keeping on. That's yeah. what I'm keeping on anyway. And uh, I think a lot of people's exposure to, to karate is probably through uh, Cobra Kai and Karate Kid. Yeah. So how, how, how like, accurate is that competition, the real competition in karate? Yeah. Cobra Kai is class, State, state Valley. Is, it, is, that, is that how it is? I wish it was. <laughs> it would be better, better if it was. Yeah. But no, it's... It, yeah. So what so what does competition look like? Because <clears throat> MMA, obviously, it's you know it's it started as no holds barred. There's a few rules now, but ultimately, it's yeah. it's win through a number of different methods. And uh, there's obviously a, a ten must point scoring system similar to boxing, um, but obviously the submission or knockout will just trump everything. Jiu Jitsu is very similar in regard to you've got it's a, obviously an accumulative scoring system, but again, a submission will just trump everything. Yeah. You know, with something like judo, it's you know a, again. You got the ip on, um, but if you get to ten points or an ip on, it's over. Yeah. Um, so how does how does the, the the point scoring in karate work? So again, for for like kata, that would be like a a judging system. You'd have five or seven judges. Um, they would give you a point score on like how you did. Um, kumite would be and again, is it actually called kumite? Kumite. Nice. kumite. kumite. You ever seen Bloodsport? Kumite. No. Well, yeah, yeah, I <laughs> have seen Bloodsport. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was younger. I like, yeah. <laughs> but they um. Yeah, it's not like it's not like turning up in the the woods with a bag of trophies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. But um, yeah, and then it would be depending depending what what type you did. We did a lot of my um, competition career was the adage of um, one point one score. You know that so you'd have a full point. You'd go for an ippon. That's what you'd be looking for. You might get what's uh, what's that? So an ippon is a decisive technique. Ippon means like deciding technique. So. Um, 
the, the Japanese have this thing, it's called hikinakatsu, it means one blow, one kill. Because in the old days, you only had one chance to hit someone before they drew their sword or they drew their weapon, you had one chance. So everything you had, that's where you see all these guys like punching makawara and like sharpening their their tools or their hands. Okay. So when they, they punch, you know, they're, they're hitting these, you know. So is it effectively like a decisive blow? Yes. That would, uh, a really good it's, punch it's kick. Ippon is like decisive blow. That was the, the, the winning, your chance. That's your one chance. Right, okay. That's what it thing. So those, a lot of my career was competing was under those rules. And was it full contact? No, um, not full contact, but you had to hit to score, okay. but you, you couldn't draw blood. Okay. It's a real big fine line. Okay. So talk me through that. So, so were headshots <laughs> allowed or not? Yes. They were allowed, but yes. you, you had to pull, hit, you had to pull hit, your shots. Hit the, yes. Okay. And the Japanese call that sundame, and it means to arrest the technique. So it means you, you need to use your technical skill to get the technique, but also your understanding of training to be able to control that technique. Which that is, must be hard. <clears throat> I'll just that must be fucking hard. Yeah. To be, to be able to punch someone in a... Because to actually hit someone who's trained is hard anyway, but then to kind of pull your punch yeah. would be hard harder wouldn't it than to actually hit them hard yeah it's, uh, but, again, <laughs> but again, again it's relative to what what level you compete at you know if you you see it in a, a small local tournament where not you haven't got very skilled people in it yeah. it's going to look very different to you see a tournament where you've got exceptionally skilled people in it who who understand that they, the distance management is so good they, they're in control of everything they do and they because they practice individual techniques over and over again for thousands of times, which is the premise of this walking up and down basic, yeah. like punching thin air. Unless they to, get that opportunity, to, boom. Yeah. It's to find, like, um, polish those techniques, isn't it? Yeah. And what, and what weighting did have uh, competing have in regard to gradings? Well, did you have to... Uh, like, not comp- really. Nothing? Okay. No. I, I'm, I'm, you had to, like, fight and compete, but the actual competition was always just competition yeah okay so you'd never have to do it if you didn't want to you could just no go to karate yeah. as a hobbyist sort of yeah thing. It's it's same as anything isn't it yeah. you know you don't have to compete in anything if you yeah i think is it only judo you have to to get your black belt isn't oh, i don't know they do it on a they do it on uh, a point think, score and if Mark you want to go up as a higher dan grade you have to okay. beat you have to compete or something like against that, isn't it? people of that level or your level yeah um yeah, I quite like that. I think, again, we've talked loads about jiu-jitsu and the application and, and how that's often um, belts are given. But even with jiu-jitsu, I think if someone's never competed and they, they, they're getting a black belt, I'm a bit like, oh. That's why that pressure testing is so good. Yeah. I mean, that, and for me, as soon as I've like started jiu-jitsu, it was mm. like, this is the best thing because <laughs> of that. Yeah. But then it only goes back to, like, I've always competed. Yeah. So, you know, again, not everyone's going to feel that. It's only people who like comp- like that competition that you, I, I can turn up for training when we're like rolling in the morning and it's like a little competition isn't it you oh, know yeah. so if you up. love that it's getting mm. my head kicked in daily <laughs> <laughs> or squeezed in <laughs> yeah squeezed in yeah that's it, isn't it? so uh, so as, as a as a sort of experienced karate competitor and and athlete um, how did you how did you kind of find Jiu Jitsu then right so that was um, I'd, I'd always wanted to do like an add on to cry <clears throat> and I used to train with a group of my friends we'd all competed against each other for years um, uh, from around the country we all very similar grades or like um, um, and we always used to like get together for a little while we got together um, a few years um, a friend of mine like organised it who, Simon who's is sick down in cry um, at Blackburn Jiu Jitsu now but because of that we'd all used to get together and then we'd hire a hall and fight for an hour and just sort of like test what we was doing yeah. it was nothing to do with anybody it was just a group of friends probably about 10 12 of us that would it was one of those sessions that you had to train for you used to shit yourself going to because <laughs> you knew it was going to be yeah. like a tough session with yeah. tough competitors but everyone wanted like a bit of a an edge on it and the edge was even though we we're all karate guys you invariably you'd end up on the ground with none of us having a clue what you're Scooby <laughs> really about like about stylized jujitsu of course we'd have like our own you know stuff you can do and it's only again it's only rules that make groundwork effective there's so much you can mm. you know like do if you don't know what you're doing and and then somebody started doing a little bit of jujitsu and it was like 
oh, he's doing jujitsu. Give me a hiding on the floor. I'm going to do a bit of that. And it's sort of like, sort of snowballed from there. And then obviously I had all that. Me and the wife's, um, our life changed a little bit. And then it gave me an opportunity to do that. And then I did look for a jujitsu club. And it was, it was great to, to, to go back to completely knowing nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, what was that? What was that like being maybe the top of your game in one martial art, and then going to another martial art and then being kind of like humbled? I imagine because if you don't know anything about jujitsu, even someone who's been doing it a year will be way better than someone who's got no experience. Oh, yeah, and it and it was. It was like um, it was it was difficult. It was difficult going. I I really had to force myself first few times to like to keep going. Um. Yeah. Not so much about being that, but just y yourself, like just myself getting. So what's your ego, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's uh, that ego of you know, you know like, but you've been world champion in in uh, in a martial art, and then you go into another one. Yeah. And, I, and I tell you what, it's hats off to you because a lot of people wouldn't do that. A lot of people wouldn't go across and make that bridge. They might make the bridge to another striking sport, so maybe I don't know, tra taekwondo or judo, maybe like something like that. Mm. But. but Jiu Jitsu is so different, yeah, isn't it? It's yeah. so different, yeah. Because to, to it, because I, I I did something similar, but but it was um yeah, it was like a it was like a slower transition into it. So I I boxed growing up, and then I did Muay Thai for a while for a couple of years, and then where I was training, this is when I met Kenny. There was a group of MMA guys, so I gradually just started like training more and more with those boys, and the Hess was there as well, and so we would end up training MMA. So kind of like your like your session with yeah, your mates where I'd still have like an advantage on the feet and then they'd take me down and would submit me like instantly. <laughs> um, but when we were sparring, I still like gave my licks because I was still, you know, still able to, to light them up a little bit yeah. until they got me down. It was a very old school, like UFC style. Yeah. And then eventually I just started doing more and more of that. So I didn't go from striking just to jujitsu. I kind of hit that blend. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. I think quite admirable of your mate to, yeah, just to take off that, that sort of, sort of melted black belt that you've got from karate yeah, it, and it was it was it was tough because I, I i i remember walking in there and then thinking right how, how am i going to do this because obviously i think it was a, i think i was a fifth down at the time when i started maybe maybe i've just got my sixth down and um everywhere most places i went i would always be on the coaching or teaching or like running everyone was coming to me for stuff or that's what it felt like you know no but they would have been though wouldn't they because you were the probably the experienced guy yeah, there and, you know? I, and i was doing that a lot and it was it was difficult to go in there and think and get turned over so much and not have a clue about anything again putting that belt on and and, and trying to walk into some like walk into another dojo or like you know a hall where everyone trained without being at the forefront and just sitting in the background it was, it was a really weird like transition transition not that you'd ever um got to that position think you're in that but you just sort of gradually get to that point don't you and then all of a sudden you've got to like like stand at the back and not say anything where normally you're the one at the front talking yeah talking. saying saying yeah. how to do this how to do that yeah and it was it was difficult to keep going back a few times but the stubbornness in me was like <laughs> I've got to go back to that because <laughs> I'm never getting in that situation again where some guy that hadn't trained hardly at all had me on the ground and I had no answer for it. And that for me was like, obviously the best thing now to keep me coming back because I had no answer for him on the ground. Mm. And it was, right, I'm never going to get in. So every day I train gets me further away from that point. And that's how I look at my training. If I've had a bad session, every day I train after that is me getting further away from that bad point mm. yeah it's a funny one isn't it but like as, as a karate guy obviously you kind of had a small bit of exposure with your mates like how much more effective was jiu-jitsu when you went to an actual session with guys that have been training a while versus what you thought it would be from the outside looking in well you it's weird because you, you you always know how an effective an art is by how many people have like are doing it and and how it's and what you well, we all saw UFC you know we all watched that for like years <clears throat> but it wasn't what I did yeah and so you you've always knew that that was effective for what that is mm. obviously you're not going to be um put a jiu-jitsu guy in a boxing ring tell him have a boxing you know it's not going to be it's not the same you put it under boxing rules yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it's not going to be the same is it mm. and I, I think that was 
like that, you always knew that that was super effective. And then when you start doing, you think, oh, that's pretty cool. See if I can put that into... Did it, su- did it surprise you how much, how effective it was? Because people would lump in martial arts quite a lot with all the same thing, don't they? And then, and then you think jiu-jitsu is, is so effective, isn't it? But then not really, because I've, I've been a martial artist for yeah. 50. You don't like, you're not, you're not um, underprepared for what happens. You're just underprepared for what you can actually do. You know, you think you can do more. You think you have, oh, if someone got onto me, all I'd have, all I'd have to do is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you realise actually he knows the counter for that. All I have to do is, and that's where that's where it's the, the counter art, to the counter, <laughs> the counter to the counter, and that's where that syllabus of like techniques comes in. Then that game of chess of like he knows the next move, he's got you countered on that. Whereas once you're on the deck, if you don't know any moves, you're on the deck. Mm. Yeah, you're fucked, then yeah. yeah, yeah, it's wicked. Talk us a little bit through your uh, your coaching sort of career. So you, what age did you start coaching? Um, so uh, being like as I as a kid I, I obviously taught my help I would do some stuff with my dad and then eventually I ended up taking over the cl- at my dad's club in sort of late 90s maybe around 2000 something like that and then I've just coached from there with with my karate club yeah um, I don't have that anymore what was that called just sort of karate club oh was it yeah it was my dad had it from the 70s yeah. and it was just yeah, it just stayed the same thing pretty much in Salt Ash everybody knew we had we were obviously a karate family and you know there was quite a bit of exposure to the stuff that I'd done through the years and the paper so everybody sort of like yeah I knew knew, about knew it was so. yeah okay but, um, yeah and then uh, and just continued coaching up through then really with, with the club I had a, a really good club um Everybody competed at both Katara and Kumite, so it was like, you know, it was a good traditional club and we did really well. And, and uh, yeah, and then just eventually got into the flow role of turning up training and meeting Kenny and the guys and then it, and you guys, and it just sort of like snowballed from there yeah. to um, sort of leading up the striking sort of a, a flow mm. and how, how do you find now that you've obviously done karate done jiu-jitsu and now you're working with some MMA guys yeah. like how do you find that um, yeah I guess like what's, what's the style of striking look like for, for the, some of the guys coming out of flow now with that karate spin but still gearing it towards MMA and, and obviously watching out for the grappling and everything else but it's same, same thing again you, you, we've all got two arms two legs mm. it, it just depends what the, the rules are and how people like fight if you and who you fight in, if you've got someone who's good on the ground, you don't want to engage with them. You know they're better at you on the ground, you want to engage them. You've got someone who's good, at, you want to be able to close range. So it's it's all relative to the actual, like, the, the competition or who you're fighting. Um, I don't find it that different with, with any anything that you do. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Any, any sort of striking that you do sort of fits with anybody else you're competing with yeah okay does that make does that make make sense with that yeah yeah no it does yeah I think so I, is, is it like i think is it from an outsider point of view is it any so kickboxing to karate obviously is different a different sport was it is it a different style of punching kicking from karate to kickboxing do you have to adjust that to for them to be able to do it i know that some of the boys do kickboxing k1 blah blah blah, blah. Do, you have, do, you have, do you change yeah but again what you've learned again the score the score how you score the fight will make a big difference to how you defend a fight. Okay. You know, you can have like tie boxing, tie guys get kicked on the arms, that's a scoring technique. K1, it's not. So and then it depends on that's the, so the scoring criteria or the, the rules of the actual match that you do dictate the actual style of the fight to be on. Yeah, that makes sense. That was one of the reasons that I really enjoyed uh, Muay Thai tie boxing back in the day. Because I, I mostly did amateur boxing and I was a, a fan of pro boxing where they just, especially Tyson back in the day, where you're just punching people's heads off. And despite the fact that I've got a completely different body type to Tyson, I still aspire to be yeah. like Tyson. Um, but in amateur boxing, they often, because again, it was a point scoring, similar to, I guess, karate. So it was like tap, 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 tap. If they get past your jab and hit them with the cross, yeah. if you miss with that, hit them with the hook. And it was very much based around the, the kind of, you know, the Olympic style scoring that you see. Yeah. And with that, you just have, you got the white bit on the glove and you just need to touch that on someone's face to score. 
or certainly back when I was doing that, that was what I was told. Whereas when I started doing Muay Thai, one of the first things they said to me about Thai boxing is to score with a punch in Thai boxing, you've got to snap the head back. So you have to step in and put weight into the shots. So if you just flick out the shots and you hit them, but they don't move, there's no score. <laughs> um, so you had to have heavy shots and that's why I really enjoyed it because of that heavy punching style. So again, it just, like you say, it's the, the scoring will dictate, I guess, the style. One of the, big, one of the biggest things, you look at um, Taekwondo, and this is not like a knock at Taekwondo at all, because obviously you've got like, good exponents in every art, but the art gets, I want to say, destroyed or watered down by the actual rule sets. So now their scoring thing, you, you watch now, your big toe only has to touch someone's hat. So actual technical kicking is a different thing altogether. Now it's just about someone who's more supple than the other person and get their legs up. If you watch like the Taekwondo that was in the Olympics just recently to the Taekwondo from the Seoul Olympics, you would not believe they were the same art. Mm, that different. Yeah, huge, massively, massive. And that's become of the, like the electronic scoring things where, like you say, the white bit on your glove would be your scoring bit, but now you've got like a sensor in your hat that all you've got to do is touch the hat and the sensor goes off and you, show, you, yeah. you know, possibly are scoring a point but yet, as an art they are like night and day difference mm. <laughs> and that's just to do with like the how the how the so points are scored uh, again I'm complete I, I don't really know what Taekwondo is same you know what I mean what, what difference is Taekwondo to Karate so it's Korean is that is that is it's it the same ty- is it the same type of style of fighting that's what I mean like is it uh, sort of stand up okay. but again yeah it's stand up is probably the very the very similar parts of the art. A lot of the Taekwondo, um, Korean stuff is very based. There's a there's an awful lot of um, similarities in all their they have pums or what's the other tulls, pums or tulls, which is the same as their katas, same right. as our katas, but they're very similar in a lot of the moves. So a lot of those were taken from okay. the Japanese originally, and then it was just Korea, and it just again how they. Um, teach it or the, the rules to their competition is how it's now evolved into you see that with jiu-jitsu though as well don't you you, you look back at sort of you know gracie jiu-jitsu you know that's a very particular style of jiu-jitsu and and then you look at 10th planet jiu-jitsu and to some extent yeah. other than the fact it's on the floor looks very different Mass- massively those ones don't they yeah and then you've got you know you've got the different rule sets so you've got ibjjf yeah so the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation, which I think was based originally on the sort of crazy style of martial arts and there's certain, you know, sort of attacks. So obviously mm-hmm. twisting leg locks, spine locks, all those sort of things aren't applicable or you, you're you not allowed to do them right up through all the belts and, and some not even a black belt. But then you've got ADCC, Abu Dhabi Combat Club, which is more of a grappling style of combat opposed to Jiu-Jitsu. And again, you know, like Lox Galore, isn't it? It's a very different style yeah, of complete, combat. Yeah, completely, yeah, it's completely different. And yeah. it, so it becomes a different... And the gi and the no-gi is different, isn't it? Yeah. The gi and no-gi are basically becoming two different things yeah. completely, yeah. aren't yeah. they? And, you know, it was years before the RBJJF even allowed no-gi competition. Oh, was it? Yeah, so oh, they were traditionally gi, and that was all they did, yeah. And then they've eventually introduced no-gi, and same with, like, even female divisions and stuff. They didn't allow female divisions for years, and that came in a bit later. Um but yeah, you see it all the time, and, it's, and obviously with you know, I think it breaking into America, the how much wrestling's had an influence on on jujitsu now as well. But even Brazilian jujitsu, the clues in the title, isn't it? That was yeah. a style of jujitsu which already existed, which was Japanese art, and they took bits from that, and then it's all full bits of judo, and now you see bits of wrestling as well. So you always see like an evolution. It, it, that, it, it's all going to go with that. You know, there'll be something else down the line. We can't think what it would be yet, but <laughs> down the line, there'll be something yeah. else that will like yeah. Yeah. slot into place, won't it? You know, something will get wiped out or people will go back to thinking, right, that style of, say, when people say now that like the karate movement is really good. Like a little while back, it wasn't karate movement. Yeah. It was the good, it was something else. And then it'll be like, in a minute, it'll be like, you have taekwondo kick in the good or let's let, go back to the hands again. You know, it will just, those little circles go around and you get an advantage over one thing because nobody does it. You go back to that. Everybody does it. Then you do the same thing again. And it's just that little circle, isn't it? Yeah. And I think what we're seeing now with like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and MMA, that was what would have happened to karate and Taekwondo like centuries ago, I guess. So you just seen it now in real time because it's, you know, it's it's now, isn't it? And you look how quick it's gone as well. Yeah. Mm. You know how quick it's evolved. Like you're saying about the different rule sets of not allowing, this is only what, five, 10 years, maybe that it's happened and that's a massive great jump in style you look at UFC from now maybe 10 years ago so di- such a different 
Oh, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it's massively and uh, yeah, continues to evolve. But yeah, it's cool, man. Um, we, we were obviously opened up talking about fake martial arts. Um, and there's a funny story that we, we might oh, share. I know he wants me to. But I want to talk a little bit about martial arts in general because, yeah, there are some really bad martial arts out there and there's some absolute nonsense online. And for somebody like yourself that's been in it for literally decades, like, you know, 70 years or so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you've been exposed to obviously striking arts, karate, um, and now the grappling arts as well. Like, what, what advice would you give to people that are maybe thinking about getting into martial arts, um, you know, and how to navigate that potential minefield that is legit versus fake martial arts? I think nowadays, I think it's a lot easier because you've got so much social media it's easy to find information years ago you didn't it was just pot luck whether you turned up the the one that was closest to you which most people went to the closest to you was legit that and that was a lottery wasn't it and even if it wasn't you know it looked all right it might have been slightly cultish or like you don't know who was teaching it and stuff like that but nowadays it's so easy to find information about whether you're doing rapid but something reputable or something not and it's a lot more um, accessible because there's a lot more clubs around, aren't there? Mm-hmm. You know, so I think really it's easy. Just just do that little bit of homework. Go and see those places and see how people interact. Really, yeah. that's the biggest thing. Maybe not even the actual style of what people do, but how they interact with each other. Yeah, I wanted to ask because we we touched on it again on a previous episode. Where, you know, that not all gyms are made equal, no. and that you know it's not always one fit one size that fits all so what do you think makes a, a good martial arts club versus a bad one is it is it the community and the atmosphere yeah 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. because most people that walk into a place you're you're looking for something or maybe as it called you're trying to repress something so you know you you bring kids into like clubs you know, he's 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 going crazy all the time i need i need something to calm him down or i need a direction for somebody and again people coming into your club six months down the line they might be the best training partner you've ever got Mm. so that community is the only thing that really like is a good base you can everybody can have all the credentials in the world but if you don't know how to deliver those credentials or you don't know how to impart that information to other people makes no difference in the world Mm. so having a good like community seeing how everybody interacts with each other that's the best i would say that's the biggest thing or it's, it's, it's a good base for you to to start your journey on it so you might not know not everybody might have a thing but if you have a good understanding a good um there's good people in there you've got a good chance of being at a decent club yeah yeah so that'll be a massive thing because skill level's great but doesn't matter you can have some 10 you know 10th down or whatever It, it it makes no difference if they can't deliver if they can't impart and create a community. Yeah, yeah, that's good advice. And a lot of people watching UFC now will walk into to fight gyms or martial art academies. And the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, I wanna be a fighter, I wanna compete. What's your advice to people that are doing that, the people that maybe see it on the TV, wanna compete? Obviously we've talked about competition in jujitsu and karate and MMA, but yeah, what's your kind of overarching advice in regard to fighting, if you're looking to start? <laughs> be honest <laughs> be as candid as you like it's, a, t- it's a tough one isn't it because you, like anybody who's got an interest in anything go for it yeah. you know just really go for it if you've got an idea you you might have should we say maybe a higher opinion of your ability which you need to start with everybody needs that like yeah you got to have that in you of course you have yeah you've got to think yeah I could do that whether you can do it or not is a different thing altogether and whether it is the right thing for you at the time is good but I would say anybody just just go for it and just see but and then don't put pressure on yourself that's the thing because it takes martial arts takes so such a long time you, m- you might be lucky you might have like natural attributes you might pick it up really quick like we were saying back like you can ride on people like that but most time most people haven't mm. most and you gotta you gotta commit a lot of time to do that yeah and do you think that the the style of fighting that you want to compete in should also have some consideration because obviously losing in jiu-jitsu the consequences of that are far less than the consequences of losing in mma for example yeah, yeah i mean if you don't like getting punched in the face <laughs> probably not the same like the good thing for you isn't it you know that's it's um i just i just think everybody should 
should go for something like this, especially as a man. Do you think like, they should you know, go in and have like an underlying martial art that they, so say they want to do MMA, would you say yeah, go in and concentrate on, I don't know, getting good at wrestling, getting good at jiu-jitsu, getting good at a form of it to go in and then have a, like a good base level. So you go in there and instead of doing MMA straight away, you go and do a year of jujitsu and people think, oh, fucking hell, but you, you need years of jujitsu to even be good at MMA in my opinion. So or, or not maybe not even jujitsu, but wrestling or some form sambo, anything like that, yeah. you know? So I don't think you need any anything to start to come to a gym. You don't need any of that. You just got to have a bit of keenness for it, I would say. Keen, keenness to do... Um, whatever you, you're throwing yourself into. And that's one thing, like at Flow, that we don't do is have, we don't have a, a, a middle MMA class. We have separate jiu-jitsu, separate kickboxing or stand or striking so that people can get competent at each. And then if they are competent at each or, you know, just picking one or the other, and then if you do want to put it together, then you've got good basic foundations and then you meet them in the middle rather than have the middle thing and trying to like cut off all the time yeah you have that good um stand up and ground and if you like if you you're getting good and you want feel like you want to put that together then you can sort of like look at your wrestling and your which you will touch on in in each of those classes to a degree but having the the one track down the middle and then trying to branch off if you don't know if you haven't trained before can be very difficult there's just, just far too much to to pick up on isn't yeah there? no I agree I think if you've come in with like a, a base martial art already like you were saying like yeah. karate or boxing back in the day for me or whatever it was then that's a little bit easier to maybe get into MMA like MMA but yeah I agree I think if you're a complete novice it's, it's so broad it's so vast yeah, it's huge, yeah. Yeah. like freaking where do you even start um, and yeah when I was doing more MMA it was very much jiu-jitsu Muay Thai wrestling and then like almost like a gelling session mm where you then sort of start pulling that together and say, right, okay, well, how, you know, how can you throw a, a punch in the, in, in the, in the jiu-jitsu transition, you know, and, and how can you set up a, a wrestling shot with, so a, with a kick? Much, yeah, yeah the time, just the time alone to do it all. Yeah, well, that's it, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not like you can't just... It's so fucking much. Oh, yeah, you, you know, know what I mean? It's got, so much. Like, it blows my mind with jiu-jitsu alone. I, I, yeah. That's why... I, it's not that I haven't wanted to, but when, when we on about doing the kickbox, I don't think I got the fucking room in my brain. <laughs> yeah. mate, to, 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 do you know what I mean? I don't think I got yeah. the room to yeah. add anything else in, you know, because jujitsu takes up all of, all of my capacity, mate, yeah. to even think about what's going on, let alone add in other things, you know? So those guys, when they are really good, you know, we got some good guys down at the gym now and I see like how good they are at jujitsu, but then they, then they're in a bag and you think, fucking hell, they're good at that. And then they're good at wrestling and they're good at, and you think, fucking so much to it to get, good to even get in that ring yeah. at an amateur level yeah. just to even get in that ring at an amateur level you got to be fucking good oh, especially <laughs> hats off especially it? nowadays again what we were talking about with like you know, like information or places that you can go and train I mean the world's such a smaller place that you can get you know you can go different places and train and there's more um, gyms around like Flow yeah that are readily available to people to go and train at, aren't there? You know, that, that years ago, when was probably, even when you started, Paul, you, there's not that amount of places that you could go or gyms or facilities that you could go and learn any of this. You know, you, everybody said when they started, you know, you watch a video and learn from a video and stuff like that. Yeah, well, well, I was just about to say, well, there you go. <laughs> no, you showed me that, didn't you? Yeah. That, that you Jiu-Jitsu University, mate, I read yeah. through that. It's fucking, yeah. it's a good read, but yeah, mate. it's not quite the same as watching a YouTube John Danaher fucking yeah, technique. It's, 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 yeah, the learning environment now, mate, is, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's amazing, but you're like, you're like, you, you're like, you kind of demonstrate what you've got available now because of how quickly you've got to like the standard that you've got. Whereas back in the day, like that, to get where you are now, it would have taken you probably at least a couple of years of, of, of probably doing it all wrong as well. So I think <laughs> yeah. the training partners that you've now got, the facility that we've got flow, and obviously the resources available now um, online, you know, with the amount of gyms of, you know, a, a sort of in sort of surrounding cities and then people coming down and, and helping out and showing techniques. It's, yeah, so it's such a good time to get into martial yeah. arts now, I think. And That's those awesome. guys that can afford to put all that time into that training, they're the guys you're trying to compete against. Yeah. So you yeah. have to, so yeah. that, so it does make, it's not only what you can do, but you've got to be thinking, Jesus, if that's my opponent, who's got nothing except he turns up and trains all day, I've got to do an awful lot to beat him. Yeah. yeah. No, you true, know, so yeah. you've then got to almost like do more than he has. You spoke about that before when you were younger, didn't you? That, you know, you and Kenny used to 
go against each other yeah. and you were working all the time and Kenny was doing jujitsu all yeah. the time and then he just <laughs> and it's and it's you know it's it's crazy isn't it because those lads who can put in that time it's obviously talent and loads of other factors but time on the mats and time in, in what you're doing that's, is huge isn't it that's the main thing though just turning up for training training I remember you said to me with um, when we was doing the competition I went in the adult division and you told me not to you said go in the masters and you said n literally not because you may not be good enough but you might be against someone who is training full time <laughs> yeah. in the adult division you yeah. might get a 23 year old who has no job yeah. is doing jiu-jitsu all the time at least you know really if I'm going in the masters one at you know I'm going to be between 30 and 35 most blokes at that age will have a job yeah. mm -hmm. so they'll be at a similar sort of training time or I'll probably be in fairness I'll probably mm -hmm. train more than them mm -hmm. because I work out so and at an amateur level of competing you want to be tested against people at the same stamp as you yeah you don't necessarily like, what what do you get from thinking oh, okay there might be uh, going the other way there might be a guy that's like 20 years older than you yeah and you're going to beat him what do you really get from that? Mm. Or you the other way around, you go against some guy who's like 20 training all the time and he really beats you. Whereas there's no real competition in that. It's not, it's not a level playing field before you start. But if you want to actually test your skills, you want to go as level playing field as you can and then it becomes your training against somebody else's training. Yeah. And that way yeah. you, you get a, um, like a relative level of how well you're doing don't you yeah. yeah that's good advice yeah no i agree with that i mean i think there's obviously depending on what outcome you're looking for in regard to competing you know there's some reasons to to maybe compete in the adult division if you're older but i think yeah for for most people that just yeah. want to use yeah. it as a test bed you know people just want to like you just want to enter in a few competitions okay if you're entering competitions and you're like you got your head set on being world champion yeah you it does that that doesn't come into it but we're not talking about yeah. Like that to start with, to get that little bit of experience, to see where you sit and how your skills stack up on a competitive plane. Yeah. yeah. You need to start somewhere. Yeah. And I think with MMA as well, like going back to what you were saying a second ago, but yeah, I mean, back when I was fighting, you know, you had some really shit gyms around and the knowledge available to people was very limited. So you would sometimes get some easy fights. Whereas I think these, this day and age, oh, yeah. like, this, yeah. like you don't get easy fights anymore. So if you're going in there unprepared, you're in for a really bad fucking, you know, 15 minutes. Do, or, do you know anyone who's been in a ring unprepared? <laughs> <laughs> you, you want it, don't you? All right. So back in the day, back in the glory days, um, I was training at, uh, with Kenny at the time, but at Saints. And we, uh, this guy come down from London called Lola. Um, he was down here studying, I think, but he was like an MMA guy, old school MMA guy, proper athlete. Um, you know, used to be a little VTs and little Valley Tudor shorts. Um, and he had a fight coming up. So it was a local show up in Exeter called Strength and Honor. And he had this fight coming up. So we were helping him train a little bit. And we said, are you fighting? And he was like, oh, I don't know. It's this Kung Fu guy. And we were like, okay, interesting. I mean, it was going back probably 15 years ago. So, you know, why yeah. not? And we said, all right, what's his deal? And he was like, well, apparently he's designed this new system of Kung Fu. It's like nine systems Kung Fu. And uh, it's unlike anything you've seen before. <laughs> um, and the guy wants to test it in a real fight environment, but he doesn't want to break the law. So we decided to sign up for an MMA fight so we can fight no holds barred, you know, as close to that as you can get. All right, fine. So we go to the event. This guy's this guy Lola is legit, a legit fighter. Legit fighter. Um, goes to the event. He comes down, gets in the cage. And then Kung Fu fighter, the song comes on. <laughs> <laughs> right. and this guy comes down to the ring he's wearing glass sunglasses bandana like dancing his way down the ring gets into well, into the cage gets into the cage um, and we're thinking we're like a little bit confused watching but we're thinking it's obviously just it's mental it's mental warfare the guy's obviously taking the piss he's going to get in there and, and, and he's going to be a savage maybe. yeah he's, <laughs> yeah. he's going he's gonna to take it seriously anyway he gets in and anybody who knows fighting um, like some variation of this is the stance, right? The athletic stance, one foot forward, hands up. And anyway, this Kung Fu guy gets in square on, hands here. <laughs> Starts staring at this guy Lola. And again, we're thinking, oh, it's my game. So he's going to, as soon as the bell goes, he's going to switch to stance. Bell goes, did not switch into a stance. Ends up staying in this position, shuffles forward, goes left, goes right, eye contact. Lola, poor guy, is like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> so eventually he pulls out like a little jab just to have a feel. And this Kung Fu guy gone to try and break his arm obviously it didn't work pulled his arm out of the way 
I had a little thing and just like fuck it jab cross bang knocked him out cold <laughs> <laughs> laid him out on the floor um, and yeah not the guy out so bad that he got up I don't know five minutes later and started trying to tackle the referee and stuff it was one of those yeah. comical moments um, we then returned to a later event the same guy was there this time he was taking a different approach fought someone else not from our club went in for like a, a weird takedown got choked unconscious <laughs> And then sometime later I was training and this guy came into the gym and he looked really familiar. And I was like, I know this guy from somewhere anyway, he's training. And you could tell he'd done some sort of training, but his style was a bit weird. And after a little while, I realized that this guy was the Kung Fu guy. (laughs) That guy is Nick. (laughs) (laughs) And Nick's now obviously one of the coaching staff. Uh, 15 years on, he's a really good martial artist, very clever guy. And I, uh, I spoke to him about this and I was like, mate, I don't understand. Like, what the fuck were you thinking? You clearly did a fake martial art. It was bullshit. Like how is such an intelligent guy who's now a very good martial artist, um, you know, purple button jiu-jitsu, but hasn't trained for years, but he got that in 2015, same time as me. And yeah, I was just like, I don't understand. And he just said, mate, the thing is, you, you, like you say, you walk into the wrong place and someone is a good enough salesman and they, they've got their little minions demonstrating, you know, enough techniques and you just buy into it. And again, you go back a few years when there was, you couldn't, re- you didn't really know, there was no yeah. way of really finding out. Yeah, there was no, there was, yeah. there was no social been. media like no, that. And no. to go, well, this is fucking bullshit. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, you know, he's, he's been led to believe that this martial art is effective in a real situation. And then the fucking absolute idiot who was teaching it is then put him into a fucking fight to test it. And he's, yeah. he's got knocked out unconscious. There was another lad um, from the same club who, who also fought on the same card and got really beat up it was just horrendous and, and that's the danger of fake martial arts and yeah people need to be really careful but as you say these days there's a lot more information available <laughs> yeah. so you just got to do your due diligence I think yeah and, it, and again these, you know as, as being for us as coaches you've got to make sure that's you know prevalent in your, your thoughts isn't it like someone's safety against you know you're teaching people to do some really dangerous things if if again if you if you're trying to if, if i can want to teach you to do something to get some guys untrained yeah you know that's really irresponsible as somebody is as a coach but back then there was less um awareness yeah less yeah. awareness and less accountability one. i think yeah, as well yeah that's yeah yeah but it's, it's a good point and even think about the flip side of that because you've seen it yeah. a couple of times recently where people have got something in a rear naked choke and fucking held them there for yeah. 15 minutes not not knowing that you you, you know because you're not untrained you don't realize you think shit i don't want to let go and yeah. your panic sets in and you you just hold on to it because you you're scared of what yeah. you know scared maybe the wrong word but you know, you, you, you panic at the repercussions if you let the, it go. You, you don't, if you're untrained, you don't understand. You, know, you might see it, but you don't understand what you're actually doing. You don't understand it's a blood choke. You don't understand what the actual mechanics are behind the choke. Do you know what I mean? You'll see someone on UFC, whatever, do the choke, yeah. and you kind of do a variation of it, mm-hmm. not knowing really what you, you, that you're doing a blood choke, you know, that you're pulling your chest in, that you know after six seconds, eight seconds, they're going to be out for the count if you've got it in mm-hmm. tight and... That's the fucking danger. And even trained people, if you're doing it under those sort of situations, aren't you? You know, it's okay being trained in a, in a club or in a, in a gym just to, with people you're training with, yeah. but then you put it under a pressure situation. Do, yeah. Do, is, yeah. You know, yeah. what happens to the police all that time? Yeah, yeah. well, this, this goes back to some of the earlier points that we made, like two in particular. One was around that, that competing. To get a black belt, you should compete because you need to understand yeah. that pressure and how you, you need to know how you react under that. Or if you're coaching other people, how they might react into that. And the other thing is potentially with like, I guess with the child black belts, not saying it's right or wrong again, but there is that risk that a kid gets a black belt at nine, doesn't then train for years, gets to 20, I need a bit of cash, I'm a black belt, I'll teach that. And they go out and start teaching a martial art and it's... And it's a very watered down version of what they've, that what they can remember from a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hugely, yeah. we went through a few competitions like years ago and you'd have, obviously the, so some of the, um, I don't want to like knock on referees things like that because it's a difficult job mm. I became qualified myself is it because so then I could argue points and, <laughs> yeah. and be like well actually I'm qualified as well so I can argue these points yeah. so I went and did that as well um, but not a thing I want to do but you used to awful, you used to get a lot of especially in the kids categories and it, I'm talking now as an, as an adult when I was running the squads and stuff they were never going to have the perfect technique like adults do, of course you don't. But you 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 give them that space. There's a, there's a, a fine line between being not scoring technique, 
or a scoring technique. Now, if they're sort of like ninety percent on that, you know the criteria for scoring yeah. it, eighty ninety percent at kids level, you should be doing that because you don't want them like battering the shit out of each other. But then you have an awful lot of like people that weren't thinking of those repercussions of that and they let these kids go and they'd end up smacking the shit out of each other. We had kids that were like noses all over the place. <laughs> and these are like kids covered because the referees weren't allowing um, um, allowing spaces, for differences between being a kid or an adult, yeah. you know? And they were expecting get, the same thing. Exact, expecting yeah. the same thing. You just get an awful lot of like injuries and like, especially like young, um, young teens, I would say. Did you ever see? Did you ever see like go to a competition at uh, black belt? Turn up and there was some just completely fucking useless black belts. Did you have that sort of stuff? hundred all the time. Do you know what I mean? Where you must have thought, fuck's sake, a rude in our sport just because some well, look, idiots give them a fucking belt when they shouldn't have well, one. Look, look what it is. For, for instance, for for crap, and, I, and I'm definitely not knocking it. I, you know, um, the the art is only as good as the people doing it. No matter what art it is, it doesn't doesn't matter. You good ones, you got bad ones. Was well, a tool, isn't it? Of course, it is. of course it is. But you'd end up, you'd go to a tournament um, and it was a knockout tournament. So you do, uh, a lot of times you would, it would just be one over 16s and that would be it. Black belts yeah. over 16s. So you might go there, you might have 40, 50 people in your category yeah. and that would be, and it would just be luck of the draw, knockout tournament. Not everyone in that competition was a black belt. worthy of oh, being yeah. a black belt or, all right, they might have been to what they were doing in their club, but not necessarily if you had a a decent high, if you held yourself to a higher standard, standard yeah. probably wouldn't have been the same. But then that's the same as everything nowadays, isn't it? You know, not everything is the same. There isn't a standard. No. And eventually, unfortunately, that'll get like... Oh, it's hard to, it's hard to manage that standard, isn't it? Because you get, you know, it's like anything. You've got an absolute savage who is, knows everything and is, is really good. And then, you know, no one would be a black belt if they had to be as good as Kenny, for example. Does that make sense? Like if everyone had to fight Kenny to get their black belt and beat Kenny, say, when he's fighting fit and ready to go, is there anyone at flow would even get near that? No. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's that standard, isn't it? You know, and, and that's where it becomes a bit hard, doesn't it? Because, you know, people might know techniques, you know, then they might know all the techniques, but they may not be able to have the physical, mental, anything prowess again, to be able to yeah. do it in a real thing. But then again, it's like, are they a black belt then? Because they can't maybe do it on a but, but, person, we, but then we, are they a black belt because they got all the techniques and they got the knowledge base, yeah. you know, it's, it's. Well, we talk about, we talk about a black belt as if it's a standard. Mm. But it's not. No, it's just right. a point. It's a point of time. It's a point of like, how long, how long you've been training, what, uh, you know, what you, what you've done, you get to that point And then it's how you deal with it after that. Isn't it? Like a lot of, I don't know, again, I'm not trying to like knock it in any way, but a lot of traditional martial artists, you get to a black belt and it's almost like you get to a level and you've, you've done it. But most people look, look at like mm, gradings yeah. and things like that. Okay. I've done it now. Blue belt was example. Good, great one in jujitsu. I've got my blue belt. How many people leave a blue belt? Yeah, huge because dropout rate, they've yeah. done it. But why though? I don't understand Yeah, that. exactly. But that I'll say that and then a year's time I'm not doing it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two years time I'm blue, blue belt blues mate I think. Yeah, yeah. But it's that bit of, I, I've got to that point that, that point is your starting point my, my best things that I ever did was got, I got my awarded my uh, my fourth down my, well, my, I got awarded my fourth and my fifth down but when I got awarded my fourth down it was the best thing that ever happened because it made me I felt it was such a big grade that I had to like prove that I was that grade and as soon as I did that, it took me, like, I got even better from that because it was like, I haven't, my dad said to me, like, you haven't, you haven't got there. So you just started on that grade. You're not a fourth down. You've just started. You've just that's got to give it. That's a good point. It. Yeah, that's a good and point. It, for, yeah. And it, one of those things that sticks in your, sticks in your brain is thinking, no, I've got to live up to that grade. Yeah. I'm not that grade. I've got to live up to it. But most people don't. You, you use that as a... That's I've got to but it. But that's another yeah. thing, though, isn't it? If if like what you just said, that you got to live up to your belt, yeah. and uh, we've talked about it a few times. It's quite nice for me because I'm bottom of the chain. You know what I mean? It don't matter if I catch someone with something fucking brilliant. If I don't, and they smash me repeatedly, oh, I'm a white belt, so it don't matter. But we talked about it before, where you're a higher belt, been away from jujitsu a little bit, coming back in, people know 
you know that you're, you're fairly good in this and that and then you go back in after a break and it, it does put people off doesn't it yeah 100 yeah. yeah it's hugely difficult isn't it to to do that yeah it was really tough for me to come back after two years of, of not training at all and, and some of that was obviously as a result of the pandemic and with the work that i do i just couldn't train but there was certainly then a period where i could have trained and i was like oh, i don't want to go back <laughs> you know and and actually what i helped was going to like london and and training at a different gym <laughs> and pressure testing myself with guys that didn't know me yeah. before then coming back to, to the monsters down our flow. Yeah. Many of whom I used to rag around before and they're like, uh-huh, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> but then you do, you, again, you put, you put yourself up there as well, don't you? Yeah. You almost like see yourself as you expect more out of yourself and it's difficult when, you got, when life gets in the way nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. But I, I think... Yeah, it, it, it's 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 so true, and I think I've joked before about like being a life on purple belt because I quite like it because I've been a purple belt long enough now that I can represent the belt without really trying that hard. Yeah. Whereas if I were to ever get a, another belt one day, I'd probably have to up my game a little bit. It's yeah, it's frightening. That's why I, I feel I feel quite like that. Lucky with like now in round back now, I'm I'm on the wrong end of like being a youngster, mm. so it almost gives you like a bit of a safety net that I'm not trying to compete with like young brown belts mm, and yeah. stuff like that. And I don't have to, you know, I don't, oh, yeah. I don't need to. I just want to be a pain in the ass. You mm. are a fucking pain in the ass. Yeah, but, that, <laughs> but, but that's that, the exact that, thing. That, that affords you like, yeah. no, yeah, there's no weight know. on your shoulders to do yeah. that. And it's quite, it's a nice place to be. I don't know if I'd like, you know, you got to really want to be competitive if you're like, like, like a, well, a young purple belt a young purple belt yeah. you've oh, got to yeah. be competitive yeah. you can't just sit sit and do it I quite like the fact that I don't have to be a competitive yeah like brown belt doing mm. it you know I could just be it's alright he's old <laughs> <laughs> that's right. that's and, right. then you, and then you still fuck everyone up so yeah <laughs> he's not expected to do that. look someone will fall off him in a minute again. <laughs> but, yeah um, no it's good man what what toll on your body has martial arts taken over the years yeah <laughs> yeah I know you know that <laughs> I know you know that yeah I've had a few few little injuries and stuff but you know touch word they I'm, I'm good with it now mm. you know obviously you know i'm just getting over my hip replacement and that and mm. three months in from that i think i'm extremely lucky i had a, obviously great crazy se- yeah i mean seven weeks and i was back rolling that that was my first session rolling after seven weeks after a hip replacement is you know f- you know phenomenally good i Oh, I can't find any information myself and yeah. many people do and I'm back like kicking and yeah I mean that, that's an insane recovery and I guess the only other person I can think of obviously well known in the jiu-jitsu community who's who's kind of demonstrated what you can do post-op is obviously John Danaher who's yeah. obviously had hip replacements as well and still um, very effective on the mats but yeah I mean I've worked with some people that have been throughout the same operation as you and yeah what you've achieved I think is remarkable so it's obviously not held you back but the leading up to that was that as a result of just was it like a particular injury or a string of injuries or was it just the start of training yeah or was, it just, so. or was it just a fact you're I in your 80s and yeah I just fact I'm in my 80s <laughs> <laughs> well the worst bit was when I went obviously you know you'd see me hobbling around the gym for like <clears throat> quite a while now really and um, yeah and you just sort of like get on with it and it wasn't till I went and had it actually seen about think because you know originally you sort of think oh no it's just another just another knock you're always you're always bruised up or battered or got yeah, caught yeah, something yeah. awkward and you know um and then you think oh, I'll be right in a minute and then obviously I wasn't all right in a minute and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and then I went to see it and he said yeah it could have been an injury that you had like 30 40 years ago you think no, no fucking fucking 40 years ago it's not me <laughs> it can't be me he's talking about <laughs> but it's like he said you, it could have been something that's like started that long ago and um obviously there's only the last couple that it got worse and worse yeah. but yeah but that one I obviously I had my eye done when that was Okay, yeah, you, so that you was, mentioned that to me before. What was that exactly? You you, you had a similar injury to me, didn't you? You fractured your eye socket? Yes, yeah. So I do, or the orbit will come off. I've got a big old, like, scar that goes down here. That's, um... Put up the wrinkle, mate. Yeah, that's <laughs> what he did. <laughs> mate, honestly, amazing how he did it. He had one stitch. Yeah. And this, like, just this line of one stitch. And you yeah. can't see it. It just looks like, it yeah. looks like a crease in there. Yeah, yeah. But that was in a competition. Okay. Well, got, crack competition. Yeah. So she got punched in the eye. And what, they got supposed to hold back a little bit, the fuckers? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you won it. Just got broke his eye. <laughs> well, it was, my, it was my mate that actually did it. 
uh, who's on the is on the squad with me at the time, um, and uh, yeah, we 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 just ended up competing against each other quite a bit, and uh, I would come off like quite well. This time he he caught me, um, I think because I didn't go. It it was one of those shots that you know when you f- think shit something's wrong there, yeah. and it was like right there, but. I sort of buckled my knee. I didn't go down, and I thought, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going down because you get if you go, if you if you get um, knocked down, you and it's a hard class as a hard comp, hard shot. Yeah. You're not then deemed to carry like right. to carry on. Yeah, you don't want to go down. You just want to stand in line. I did that, and I thought something's wrong here. And anyway, he got the point for it. So it was like, "Fuck! I should have gone down. You wouldn't have got a point then." <laughs> and um, uh, but then, yeah, I just couldn't it was really weird feeling. I could see perfectly well out of each eye, but not together. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, do you know what? I think, I think sometimes mates will compete harder against each other than people that you don't know. Fucking right. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can have a good scrap. You do, you mates, do, you do it with me all the time. Like, <laughs> <laughs> most people are getting a half decent position. They'll like, not let me have it, but anything I get near you, he's like, fuck that. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? But it was weird though. Cause Dave, and when it happened, he was, oh, he was mortified that it, that it happened like, cause it was, you know, you just knew something was not right. And, um, but then on the back of that, he ended up doing exceptionally well, not because of that, but just circumstances. He was training and we ended up, he ended up winning the SKD and open weight world championships, which was massive at the time. <clears throat> and, um, some of the things on, you know, he's talking about in training sort of knew that helped him, to get over that fact and actually win it. And it was, so, you know, if that didn't happen with circumstances, circumstances wouldn't have led us to that point. Yeah. So. What happens for a reason really, doesn't it? Does. It does. Yeah. No, so, you know, those things happen for a reason. It stopped me from doing that. It led me into coaching and then coaching the, 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 the team more. So, yeah. You know. Um, so we, we've talked obviously loads today about competing and the, the physical benefits but previously we've talked about obviously the mental benefits of jiu-jitsu and how it can support people through you know all sorts going on in their lives is that something that you found with martial arts over the years that it helped you at various points with with going through struggles yes yeah ma- massively um so going back like point you know what i was talking about so a um so in 2010 i lost my daughter um it was uh, they they put it down to um, they class it as a stillbirth. She was how much two weeks overdue. Uh, we were going in to get um, either like um, induced the next day. <clears throat> Obviously, massive two weeks overdue. The thing, the water's broke. Uh, we was going in on the Monday. I think this might have been the Saturday or the Sunday. The water's broke, and by the time we got, she was moving. You could feel her moving around and everything. And by the time we got from there to the hospital, she'd obviously died. And then, um, so then obviously that obviously changed our like mm. lives and world instantly on that from that point that was really the main catalyst then that made us change things I wanted a different job after that and um, I needed something just for myself away from training which obviously led me to jiu jitsu and and it was all that was the the main like catalyst that kicked off or like a change in lifestyle yeah you know made me change like i i gave up working in the end like a few years down the line f- from that big change and that, obviously that's led me to where i am now but without the martial arts in, involved yeah I, I i wouldn't like to think you know yeah. or, or would, or would i be in the diff- same place and I, I doubt it very much but yeah so that as it was from martial arts and mental health. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the one place at the time where I could switch off and I, I couldn't think of anything. And mm-hmm. it was just, it was a place to throw yourself. It's yeah. a good escape, isn't it? It's oh, a good yeah. escape. Oh, I yeah. just find that. And I, I still find it like now, it just, that's the, the one place that you can switch off. And I don't still think about those things. Yeah. I think it was you that mentioned Mushin, wasn't it? Mission, no mind. Yeah, yeah. so you, we, we mentioned that previously in the episode. I think it was episode one, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 it was episode one. Yeah. Um, and did you do anything else at the time to, to kind of support, I guess, with your mind, you know, the state of mind that you were in at the time? So obviously martial arts kind of switched the head off, but what were you doing the rest of the time? Yeah, so I was, so 
there wasn't a lot of I never felt there was any I had any help obviously obviously Han went through what she went through obviously she's she still had to deliver Eva and all, you know the, the stuff that goes on and the things that you, you you do on the on the back of all of that that goes on you know just it, it so I, I think so much of me le- stayed at that that point in the hospital I can remember sitting in the car like afterwards and I'm having to like ring everybody my children my older children lived in New Zealand at the time obviously they thought we was having a baby I was having a baby and I was going to ring them up and say you know all these things and then I had to sit in the car and tell them that, that things had changed you know we sort of lost it and bits me and I and I always think the bits me stayed in that stayed in that car that I never never managed to come out of that and I and there wasn't a lot of help going going past that. Mm. I, I never felt I had any help. I never, nobody ever, I never had anybody to talk to. I never had any, yeah, no, no, nothing really helped after that. But the only thing I did have was the fact that I could just go and hit something or like train or maybe not hit something is the wrong word to say, but like just throw myself into whatever I was doing as, as, as training. And that, that for me, sort of helped me get through it mm. there's still that quite a bit of um <clears throat> we're quite a lot of uh it got put down to P- it's like a form of ptsd where your brain switches off carp- compartmentalize yeah compartmentalize. Com- yeah yeah compartmentalize. Com- yeah so and, and your safety mechanism your brain just shut off avenues of like pain and things like that and then it's difficult to find it yeah. but they, they obviously it's like a form of ptsd which they then put down to but at the time they thought i had some um like early onset alzheimer's and dementia because you get the same sort of like (laughs) switches off and i had to see some of about like but that was the only help i had regarding like that that they thought it might have been some form of been brought on by right an alzheimer's or early onset dementia because i was like in my early 40s what was you, was what was you um what was you acting like for them to be like that was you just being forgetful or was you you know what i mean like was you yeah just... no, i suppose you notice it every now and again when i get stuttery on my words and, yeah. and I, never, I never used to get like that at all but it something you you struggle to find the words or and it's all part of that where the brain switches off like compartments mm. and then it's very difficult to like like retract the information yeah, retrieve it yeah. yeah yeah so i got it described as the guy's um telling me to start it's like you have another um you have like a library and you all the information comes in and you slot your library and you're not in the in the right place yeah but then when you have this it sort of muddles it up and you can't remember where you find, where they get the information from he said none of the information's gone so it's not so it wasn't like an alzheimer's thing where you can you can completely forget it mm. it's all in there but it's just you can't remember like i can't remember my children being born my older children i can't remember any of them being born i can't remember them hardly at all as kids you know when you see pictures and you can look at a, a, a photograph and you recognize you know what happened either side of those yeah. Yeah. the things i i can't do that i can see a picture i can see it but i can't re- and, that, retrieve. And, that, and that's from the the, the ptsd and from, that's from, from, that, from that event that yeah well that's, that's, that's but i never that's had crazy. any follow-up from that no no they didn't follow did it up no the only thing i had <laughs> fucking was, shit in there the only thing i had was my my the training because they put it down to being one of those things but imagine you being a guy that didn't have that outlet you know yeah, there's so many yeah. guys out there and, and women but yeah. guys like who don't have an outlet who just go to work come home and do fuck all so what what would they do you know that's that's when they end up killing themselves that's when they end that up hundred, yeah. being in that really dark place and they can't yeah. see a way out because yeah. they don't even sometimes they wouldn't even go to the doctor to get that information like angela's talked about it dr will talked about it yeah. that men were terrible for actually going and getting help you yeah. know and i would have been exactly uh, i would have been exactly the same that very much like you know you live your life like a john, an old john wayne film you know like you're a man's man you don't like you don't talk about stuff like that it doesn't happen and then something like that happens and you think shit i don't know what to do the only thing you can do what you the only thing you my your brain does is like close it all down and it you just drop them shutters so you yeah. so you don't but then you need somewhere to open them shutters back up again yeah. and i never felt like i had any of that except for training the one thing i did have on all those shit stuff was that i could go train in or like throw yourself into 
stuff that you don't have to think about. Yeah, yeah. it is amazing. It is amazing. Like me coming into it later, but mm. obviously I'm not going. But I, th- I think most everyone should try it. Yeah, you know, especially if they're struggling mentally. If you're struggling mentally, I genuinely think something like jujitsu or even karate, martial art, anything where you can go and have an outlet. We don't have it's time huge. to think about anything. No, do that's you? it. Because you someone's know, trying to kill you. You've <laughs> only got one place yeah. to be in the moment. Yeah. And if you're not in that moment, you th- you you think of other things anyway. So that does it. It gives you somewhere to. It gives you a place to deal with it. And the more the more time you spend doing it, you, the more time you, you has passed since whatever reason has got you there, isn't it? You know. So you end up being able to deal with it. And then you realise as well. There's loads of other people there. That are all going through maybe similar things, yeah. but you know, not maybe not the same issue, but you know, things in their own life that we're all going through. Of course, and everybody. then you become that that community bond. Yeah. You know, yeah. everybody's like uh, you know, got something, everybody has something, don't they? You know, and it, it's always massive to you. It like, you know, everybody can understand what happens to other people, but it, it it's only effective really to you, isn't it? Yeah, hundred you know, percent. And the people around the closer people around you, family and stuff like that. Yeah, hundred percent. I've, I've, I've said we've talked about before about the fact that I think through like jujitsu and physical adversity, you kind of develop camaraderie with other men, um, and sometimes that will give you the confidence to, to open up and speak about trauma. And is that something you experienced yeah, as well? Hundred percent. That, and I, w- I wouldn't have put it. But I, I can like talk about it now. For for years, I couldn't. Mm. You know, and it's like back twenty ten. For me, it feels like it's just yesterday, mm. and it, I'll have moments all the time. And <clears throat> um, but through that stuff it allowed my you know it allowed me to be where i am now change change my i came off of buildings and it allowed all this so you think that such a shit time in your life has led to what is a better life mm, yeah. you know and then you've got to try and deal with that yeah <laughs> you know yeah. how can you like right yeah i'm glad i'm glad where i'm where i'm now but i wouldn't have been there if that Did shit it? didn't happen mm-hmm. yeah uh, yeah on the back of that one obviously such a shit time that happened we ended up then well my mother mother-in-law did started a charity a little while later because it was called eva's little stars and it's something that we we have like um a bench she raises thousands for, the, for this and it and and then on the back of that if somebody goes through the same sort of situation loses a child or like or or, or has done before or knows anybody we have this um with the benches up the churches in salt ash where every, I want to say there's far too many, but every now and again I get we get these stars and I go and put these stars on the bench, so someone can go somewhere that if someone has lost a child or a baby they can contact the thing and we'll pay for this and then we'll put these little stars on these benches that we have. Unfortunately, I've put a lot of stars on, you know, like oh, on this, really? this bench because it's be a horrible thing. Oh, it's a big, uh, uh, it's a yeah. big build up. I, yeah. I can't, when we get them delivered, the mother-in-law gets them delivered. does take me a little mm. while to go up there. Um, it's right about this little, like children's, obviously when children are lost there, there's a little, the, 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 the graveside for like kids is normally a little separate area mm-hmm. yeah. than just, we the the yeah, yeah. so there's always a little area and we got like a little there's a little fairy garden up there and we've got a couple of benches with these stars on but if there is anybody that d- does go through this they're more than welcome to like contact us and there's, there's always help you know a lot of people go through um, you know we were in a better financial position that when we lost Eve, you're going home but then you, you're you preempting your life is going to be one way coming home with a baby but then you might have like funerals to pay for or like or not, I know as a kid, child you don't pay for a child's funeral you don't, you don't have to pay for that the church has always cover that, mm. the church up, to certain, cover that. up to a certain age yeah. I think it's like five years old but if it, you don't so you don't have that worry as a parent of losing a child of then having to go and pay for a funeral I don't know that's, that. yeah that's already that's already covered which is a you know which is something when you're not expecting you spend all your money on like oh, yeah. getting out your child so there there are little things that we as a the Ziva's Little Stars charity that will help you if you do need some financial help or pay for a grace or pay for like upkeep and stuff like that that the charity takes care of yeah. so that was it and, and on the back of that I mean she's raised like thousands for it and done exceptionally well for 
thing, but it's just a little place that people can go and have a look and see their star on the thing. But yeah, it's awesome. beautiful, mate. Yeah. How do you raise money? Is it donations or is it events? All, all sorts. She does okay. everything. Every every little like church fate or like you know thing that goes on she's down there raising money for her, like constantly but and again like saying on the back of like something bad we've raised a lot of money that's helped other people that we would never have done yeah before yeah. that yeah absolutely perfect well we'll put the link down yeah. in the description and stuff mate so people can check it Brilliant. out amazing mate. great cool. thanks yeah did you ever um did you ever sort of were you ever prescribed like, antidepressants or take any medication to help or anything no um so i i'm sure i would have been down that route i'm sure i would have been down because there's a lot of uh stuff going on at the time with you know, i never threw myself into drinking i obviously had my drinking days when i was like youngster and you know yeah. do this thing but i never threw myself into drink, which very easily could have done you know it was, um and i think if it wasn't for the fact that my wife was going through it as well you know and you had to be that it had to be the, yeah had to be there i'm sure she she was obviously there for me as well but you know um but because of that, I think we, it, it didn't throw me down that route, and and I knew full well that something would have, something wasn't right in me. Um, so I went around down the route of like finding CBD. So about probably three, four years ago now, um, maybe a bit longer, I started like looking at that, and that helped me massively. What I thought at the time. Um, How did that help? Uh, certainly, anxiety. Yeah, massive, massive anxiety I would have all the time. Mate. Really? Yeah, and then when we had like Lex, my my obviously daughter after that, two years after that, um, obviously that was the point then that I gave up work. So I became stay at home dad, Han changed the job. Um, well, not changed the job, she went back to uni after this, after it happened. And then that which led into her getting a different job. So I thought, well, I'll give up and then Han can go back to work yeah. and do what the career that she wanted to do because she used to train all the time anyway when we first met and when she was young um so she wanted to go back to the career that she started that she would have had if she hadn't have gone around for, you know we spent about so it changed 10. her life in loads of different ways like yeah obviously like 100%, yeah it's exactly the same yeah. thing you know something that that shit makes you makes you makes you change your yeah. your direction and um yeah, and then uh, well, I've lost again. And then well, like with the CBD, and that, I felt that that helped that massive anxiety that I had having Lex. Then as she was a baby, everything was like it must have been fucking terrifying. Yeah, it was yeah. terrifying. Every every little thing you like, shit, is this all right? Or and then you end up panicking and overcompensating a little bit. But the anxiety that went with it. I mean, just walking down the street. We used to go to either routine that we would we'd get up and obviously Hannah would go to work and then I'd look after Lex and then we'd, we'd walk down the street and I used to speak to everybody and it was what, but I used to get so nut, I'd be sweating like, and like the anxiety of just putting Lex in the pram and walking down the street every day, get a little bit of shopping, walking home was horrendous. And then, so a lot of research found that like CBD could help and it did for me, it was like opening up a curtains on a bright sunny day and that's, that's what it felt like to me and it was... You know, I'd say, I wouldn't say, it, like, it helped a lot at the time, that did. So, but that, going back to your question, like, no, I didn't get any drugs, but I'm sure if it wasn't, if I hadn't have found that, that helped that anxiety, yeah. something I think I would have... Yeah, that's what they do a something. lot of the time, doesn't it? Is they, they get people on antidepressants. Yeah. Angela talks about it, you know, they don't check your test levels, they don't check this, they don't check that. It's like, oh, you're not feeling great? Oh, check on antidepressants. Yeah. Well, it's surprising. That, did they ever try and put, push it on you? or like? No. That, um, that's good. Or did you not go and seek it out? Because a lot of people do, don't they? they I tried to do my own, like, um, I was looking at uh, what what people would give you for being depressed and stuff like that. And a lot, of, and I found that um, a couple of groups that I found on Facebook where they were, tr they were using CBD to get you off these antidepressant messages. And I thought, well, and that's what led me down that route. That's how I've like sort of discovered it. But you know, that's why I thought it would do well. Cause I thought if you, they're using that to get off these antidepressants, why not just go straight on that? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, it, yeah, and that's yeah. how it like, yeah, that's how sense. it sort of came about. Um, and that, did me for you. I mean, I still use the CBD in that now. But, um, and then going back to the, the, the test thing, that was when I, and then like, sort of, about a year ago now, yeah. maybe less than that, 
coming on a test, but that now I seem to be losing CBD less, and I wonder if your testosterone levels, the testosterone levels, levels yeah. all that with the stress and all that that caused could have been the actual thing I was, maybe sh- I should have looked at. Yeah, then. but it's knowledge, though, isn't it? It's knowledge to know that, you know, and um, me and Angela had that chat recently, and she said she would have loved to see my bloods seven or eight years ago yeah. just to yeah. see what's kind of happened to, to get them to the point where I am now. Same with you. It would have been yeah. fascinating to see, you know, after that traumatic event, what they were before. Yeah. And then maybe what they were a year or two after, you know? Yeah. It, it, you never know, do you? You never know how it affects the body. No, you don't. So you, you're currently on testosterone replacement therapy at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, and how have you found that's kind of changed your sort of mentality, your physicality? With everything that, obviously, my hip being bad and everything, I, 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 I always, I don't want to say I always feel, in the, right now I feel in the best shape of my life. You know, six months ago yeah. I probably felt yeah. the best shape of my life, you yeah. know? So, so I, I, I feel good for it and I'm, I'm sure it's like, helping massively i've laid off so much of the cbd and i haven't had those anxiety things again so whether that one thing's sort of like re- replacing the other or um no i'm, I'm you know i feel good I've, I, this has obviously yeah been a massive like your recovery's been crazy you know yeah, you so, can't say whether trt was a factor but it, it definitely helped uh, def- uh, def- <laughs> definitely you know i mean you? i feel good about my you know i feel in good shape I feel like I'm tr- I'm training well, um, you know. Did you feel be- better mentally going on it? Do you know what I mean? So, like, a lot of guys say that they feel a little bit low um, prior going on to TRT. And then, have you felt any, like, mental benefits from it? Do you yeah, feel sharper? I, I, Do you feel, yeah. you know, uh, the get up and go, is that back a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I, I think I think all those things, um, all the, like you say, all those things that lead you to start doing testosterone, um, we're obviously there. You you felt low. My sleeping was like horrendous. I didn't like. I think now now I'm sleeping eight nine hours mm. every night. Before I started going on, so the la- say the last since this has been done three up until then, I reckon ten years maybe that I would get two or three hours a night. Then I'll be awake. Then I get another maybe two hours, and that'll be me done. Really, For possibly t- ten years. So whether that's going back. So this being shits keeping me awake, it's been fixed. I feel good, or all well, the I think everything slotted into place a little bit, yeah. and it's all hit at the right time. Yeah. I now feel great. Like my my mood's better. I, you know, I just feel happy and contented. But that may be because I'm not. I don't get the pain from this anymore. Yeah. And I'm back training. I'm not like scared about not being able to train anymore, which is a massive like. You know, having saying you need a new hip and you know your martial arts training's done. Is that what they said? Yeah. So he said, you, you know, you're not going to be looking at getting back to doing any kicking or training or doing any MMA at all. Which is what the doctor said. Like, <laughs> you don't really know that it's like... Three months later. What, <laughs> he didn't know who he was, he didn't yeah, know he who he was talking to, did he? <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so all those being told you're not going to do that when that's all I've ever done. Yeah. You know, that was quite... Uh, f- that was qu- quite a low point. Mm. Yeah, say. of course, man. You know, I couldn't even then, imagine. Um me and Han was talking about yesterday and she's saying about um, a friend of us is, is going for a, um, a knee replacement. She says, I could have like panicked. I couldn't have gone in that morning of going in for the op. Could have very easily just like, you know, walked out the door yeah, and not gone, not, gone, not yeah. had it done and would have been okay about it. But no, obviously I've had it done and it was the best thing I've had, best thing you've had done. But yeah, so... Yeah, that's, that's that's amazing, man. Like, I think when you uh, so so many, we we just need to make it more aware that a lot of guys that are feeling low or like not feeling great, that you know, it may not be that they need antidepressants. You know, we want to really encourage people to get off the fucking antidepressants because if they're on antidepressants for too long, it's a slippery fucking slope because it never really fixes the problem or the issue. A lot of the times, it'll just be throwing drugs at it and then it's up in medication and then it's up in medication and then the side effects of those medications and then weaning people back off those medications when they're feeling better and then as soon as they're off them guess what they don't feel great again and then they gotta go back on them because they're still overweight their testosterone's still low they, you know all the different factors in their life haven't changed their environment hasn't changed you know and i think that's what you, what you've done by going on trt going on cbd doing those active things to help yourself rather than going down the medicated route mm. is probably still why you're sat here now today because there's other people that 
you know, wouldn't have done any of that, maybe go on antidepressants. And all the time, it makes them fucking worse. Yeah, yeah and it's too easy, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. too easy. it's too easy to go to the doctor, isn't it? And go, yeah, can I, yeah. Can I just have some pills, please? Mm. Yeah. And again, the, 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 the tra- all those things aside, I think, and if you do train, mm. I think even more prevalent that you, or maybe not even more, but it, it should be a thing that you, you look at. Now, I was very much, no, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine. Like, I'm, you know, I'm from not different age, but like, you know, I'm a bit older than most of the young guys. And they said, hey, you need to get new, get your tests sorted. You need some more of that. No, I'm fine. I'm still training. I'm still doing everything like. You, you become like, accustomed though to not feeling okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, like, that's we, me, me and Andrew talked about that in our, in our consultation and stuff. She's like, well, how do you feel? And I'm like, well, I feel okay. You know what I mean? Like, and you do, because, but then you get accustomed to feeling yeah. subpar all the yeah. time you know and you get accustomed to feeling a certain way and you think that is normal and if you're training you're always yeah. battered anyway so that's yeah. that point <laughs> yeah. 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 she you're said always, that to me yeah. are you tired I'm like well I am fucking shattered every day but I'm yeah. doing two hours three hours of jujitsu yeah. a day so yeah, yeah. you know what I mean but yeah no, one of the things I remember her saying on the podcast was that men just feel a bit meh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, so I'm I think, right. so yeah, I think it's definitely worth guys. You know, certainly fight plus if they've not had their bloods turned and, and had a look at that, they definitely should. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. and then it's, there's and then there's no reason when you get a bit older that you, you got to start or you, or you or you can't start training, yeah. which is another big thing. You know, especially guys like my age or maybe you know mid mid forties maybe like I didn't start to jujitsu. Not like in your mid forties. I didn't. Look at it, <laughs> I didn't look at it. But but. You, you, you can start doing all this. You can start training again if you're just feeling a little bit in there or you're just feeling... I say it to my low. clients quite a lot. I say to them like, oh, you, f- you fancy jumping on? They go, oh, no, I'm too old for that. I'm like, you're not fucking Yeah, no, 100%. Okay. I, I do. I, say, I, I yeah. look down sometimes. I go, see, see Steve down yeah. there. Sam, yeah, He's a fucking yeah. savage. <laughs> <laughs> 92 years old. <laughs> yeah, I did. Exa- I, I literally had that chat with Roy the other day when I saw him in. I was like, you jumping on? He was like, ah, too old. Yeah, it, it literally. But he would be good. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it would do his flexibility... And all the other aspects of his life would benefit from jujitsu, but it's, and, and and to be honest, with you, he knows it. He knows it, but I think it's just that initial jump onto the mats. It's yeah. that initial like, That's all right, scary, I'm gonna man. fucking, I'm gonna get on that mat, and and I don't really know what's gonna happen mm. initially. And then it's always the initial cuddle is always a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think was, that, that was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I remember me, 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 me and that. you was the first person I, I properly uh, properly rolled with, and I remember you like come up towards me and you went, "Oh fuck, I forgot you've not actually done anything, have you?" I was like, "No," and you, I was like, just lay on the bottom, get fucking fucked up. That oh, awkwardness, awkwardness yeah. when you got some bloke's face on you, oh. and he's not trying to kiss you. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah, it's yeah, fucking brilliant. Really really yeah. Like but I think once you get past that and you get past having an asshole in your face, you know, most of it, or a dick in your face, you know, you, you're all right. No, not, yeah. not for me, mate. That's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's just a different club. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's no reason as an, as an older guy where you can't, like, you cannot train. Because I bet there's so many guys that would like to, but that initial thought, let's like say, of, like, getting and thinking you've got, you got to have the same game as, like, a young 20-year-old. No, you haven't. You can have an old man's game and still do that thing and still, like help you mentally by you know just being in a club with other men or, or not just men of course but like the guys that you're going to be competitive with mostly you're going to be men women, p- competitive with each other yeah. aren't they? but you know just that alone it helps that mental health like so much can't yeah no i couldn't agree more right boys i think we're about done is there anything else you want to cover off before we finish up mate no mate. Legend. Well, thanks <laughs> for sharing <laughs> mate thanks, thanks for sharing we really appreciate it. thanks for coming on yeah. cheers mate cheers, appreciate mate. it mate